Welcome to the show today. Article 11 of the Canons of Dort, the Holy Spirit's work and conversion. Moreover, when God carries out this good pleasure in His chosen ones, or works true conversion in them, He not only sees to it that the gospel is proclaimed to them outwardly, and enlightens their mind powerfully by the Holy Spirit, so that they may rightly understand and discern the things of the Spirit of God, but by the effective operation of the same regenerating Spirit, He also penetrates into the inmost being of man, opens the closed heart, softens the hard heart, and circumcises the heart that is uncircumcised. He infuses new qualities into their will, making the dead will alive, the evil one good, the unwilling one willing, and the stubborn one compliant. God activates and strengthens your will so that like a good tree, it may be enabled to produce the fruits of good deeds. I want to continue in this show of Christ the King about the purpose of the Holy Spirit of God. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, the wonderful day of Pentecost, where at the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ, 50 days after the resurrection, God sent the Holy Spirit to fill His church, to light the flame and to bring about wonderful life, enlivening truth within their hearts so that they not only heard the gospel with their ears externally, but were able to actually inwardly respond to it in faith and live new lives in Christ. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Much questions go about this and uh, different traditions in Christianity have all sorts of answers and practices, but let's look at the scriptures. That is our one source of infallible truth. And this comes from John chapter 16. I want to look here first about the humble purpose of the Spirit who lives in you. And the humble purpose of that Holy Spirit who lives within you, Christian believer, is to make much of Jesus Christ. John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Jesus says this, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and he will declare it to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Consider this. Though the Holy Spirit is mighty and majestic and truly is the third person of the divine Godhead, Jesus says the Holy Spirit does not speak of Himself. The Holy Spirit does not speak on His own authority. Rather, the humble purpose of the Holy Spirit within you is to teach you about Jesus Christ and to take the possessions that belong to Jesus and to give them to you. After all, the Holy Spirit is, according to the Scriptures, the Spirit of Christ. This reminds me of the proverb that tells us let another man's mouth praise you and not your own. I think the Holy Spirit is the perfect display of that humility and that grace. Now, the Holy Spirit does not come to exalt Himself, but in loving submission to exalt Jesus Christ. And this is not only among the Spirit, but what does Jesus do consistently? Jesus consistently adores and lifts high the Father. And then when we hear the Father speak from heaven at the baptism of Jesus and at the Mount of Transfiguration, what does the Father do? He blesses and praises the Son. Here is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. So when we step back and get a, a big picture of the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, when we get this revelation of the divine Holy Trinity in its fullness, what do we see? The Spirit lifts up Christ. And Christ lifts up the Father, and the Father opens up, rends the heavens, and says, I love my Son. He is perfect. Everyone on earth, everyone, hear Him, listen to Him. And so, the humble purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to make much of Himself, but to make much of Jesus Christ. And if that Spirit lives within you, the purpose is the same. The Holy Spirit in you is going to make you someone who talks much and exalts much the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we are filled with the Spirit, the evidence is not feelings and emotions and spiritual highs. The evidence is holy living in the name of Jesus Christ. Spiritual character, spiritual development, producing the fruit of the Spirit for the glory and the fame of Jesus Christ. 
here in John 16, the Spirit shares what He heard, and what He hears and what He has is what belongs to Christ, and His desire is to make what He hears and what He has come and belong in our hearts and our lives, which would be the fruit of the Spirit, which would be the mission of God, and which would ultimately be the gospel that is within us. Although we are you know, mere clay jars, the power and the glory of God resides in us. And so if the Spirit lives within us, we don't get to innovate or make stuff up. We don't get to create new doctrine. We don't get to make Christianity after our own image. If the Spirit lives in us, the holy, mighty Spirit of God Himself takes not what He made up, but what He heard and what belongs to Jesus and implants it within you. And so, Christian, don't be an innovator about doctrine. Don't make stuff up and don't exalt yourself. Rather, if the Spirit lives within you, the evidence is that you take the doctrine humbly that you have been given by the Scriptures the Spirit inspired, and you honor them, you share them, and you take what has been given and give that to other people also. We are not to be creators of doctrine. We are not to be innovators of theology, but we are to be humble recipients of the absolute truth that has been passed down to us. And our example is the Spirit who does not speak on His own authority, but exalts Jesus. Also, consider this. The Holy Spirit leaves no sinner the same. The Holy Spirit leaves no sinner the same. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. There the inspired Word of God says this, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul had just made uh, one of what's known as a vice list, a list of sins, and he had talked about thieves and greedy he talked about swindlers. He talked about adulterers. Uh, he talked about men who practice homosexuality. He had talked about idolaters, those that were sexually immoral in any way, those that were deceived. And the Apostle Paul says, speaking to a church, speaking to the church at Corinth, such were some of you. The church has always been made up of repentant sinners. That's the only type of people that have ever been part of the church. Former drunks, former thieves, former homosexuals, former adulterers, former idolaters. This has been the type of people that have made up the church since day one. And the reason why is because that's the only type of people in the world, fallen, depraved sinners in need of a great Savior. And the way that our God has chosen to save us is by the shed blood of Jesus and by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Look again what verse 11 says. Such were some of you. So not only was there a need for these people in the church to repent, but there was the real ability for them to repent. Not by pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps, but by being washed in the blood and being sanctified, being justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here's what we need to understand. Christianity is absolutely supernatural. It is not the invention or the work of of people. It is the supernatural work of Jesus Christ, who by his shed blood can justify any sinner, and who by that same spirit he sends will also sanctify any sinner. And so to justify means to declare them as righteous, forgive them of all of their sins, so that they stand before God as righteous and innocent. But also, practically and in the everyday life of the trenches of the Christian life, to wash and cleanse that person from all unrighteousness. Not only for God to justify them and to declare them righteous because of the merits of Christ, but also to really practically, in everyday life, to sanctify the thoughts, words, and actions of every man, woman, and child who belongs to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit leaves no sinner the same. We're not merely twiddling our thumbs, waiting to go to heaven as justified Christians, you know, saved, sleepy, and satisfied, but we are to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God. And just as we receive Christ by faith, we are also sanctified by the Spirit by faith. How about this? The Holy Spirit empowers us to pray in the Spirit for all the saints. I get this first from Ephesians chapter 6. 
in verse 18. Here the Apostle Paul writes this, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is a wonderful thing. Prayer is one of the hardest things that we do because when we pray, we're to do it privately. We're to do it uh, behind closed doors, not for the glory and the applause of men. And if we're doing it alone and in private, then there will be no reward from people. There'll be no satisfaction from getting a pat on the back from people that you can see. And even as we pray um, in our churches and with groups, we're to do it humbly, we're to do it in the spirit. It can be very hard because we like to get responses. We like immediate responses. We like to see things happen right away. And so there will be hardly anything in your Christian life that requires as much discipline and help as your prayer life. And yet God says you don't do it alone. You don't have to work up the stamina or the spiritual intelligence or the ability on your own strength. But we pray in the Spirit. And that same Spirit helps us to pray. And so before you pray, asking for your needs, interceding for others, thanking God for who He is, ask the Holy Spirit that you would pray in the Spirit and empower you to pray not only for your personal needs, but as Paul says here, with prayer and supplication for all the saints. And we're to do this with alertness, sobriety, and perseverance. God knows that we will be tempted to not pray. God knows that we will be tempted to just throw in the towel. And yet Jesus says, we ought always to pray and not to lose heart. And so the scripture goes on to say in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What a wonderful thing. Prayer is, is not merely uh, you know, a line between you and God. Prayer is done in the Spirit who lives within you teaching you what you ought to pray for. And even when we don't know what to pray for, and we can just give out a, a grunt or a groan, the Spirit is sanctifying our prayer. He knows our hearts better than we do. He knows our minds better than we do. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to pray and pray and not to lose heart. Continuing this, the Holy Spirit of God gives freedom and true insight. The Spirit of God gives freedom and true sight. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. There the word of God says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Apostle Paul here is talking about uh, particularly the Jews reading the Old Testament and how that as they read the Old Testament, they don't see Christ there because there's a veil over their hearts. But when someone reads the Old Testament with Christ through the Holy Spirit, that veil is removed and now they can have freedom and true sight. I had a conversation before with a man who was having a lot of problems with the story of Job. Remember righteous Job who suffered uh, so many things, lost his family, lost his livelihood, lost his possessions. Uh, his skin was terribly stricken with sores. And he was scraping these sores off with rocks and his own wife says, hey Job, curse God and die. And this man I was talking to, he had a problems with Job's story. Now, how, did, how would God allow this to happen to his family? How would God allow this man to suffer just to prove that Job would still serve him in thick and thin? And this was my response, right or wrong, you tell me. I didn't give him a 10-page explanation. I didn't give him an essay. I just said this, if you read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, you will see all of your own problems and assumptions, and that's all you'll see. But if you read the Bible again with the Holy Spirit asking God to help you, then you will see the Bible rightly. And instead of seeing your own problems and assumptions, you'll see God's glory and your need of Him.
If you walk with the Spirit, you can ask, Lord, help me. Lord, teach me. Lord, I've, I've observed these things and I need help with them. Help me to understand Job's story. Help me to understand Jesus' gospel. Help me to understand Genesis and Leviticus and Revelation. And God will. Confess Christ as Lord. Live by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And you'll not be like those dry bones in Ezekiel's vision, but you'll be like those living people that were made alive by the Spirit and the Word of God. Don't even read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. Yes, it's God's Word. Yes, it's potent and it's powerful. And yet, without the teacher, without the Holy Spirit, you'll likely only see your own assumptions and your own problems. But if you read it with the Spirit first and say, God, help me, just a short prayer, God, help me as I open this Word, then I think you'll see in, in any part of Scripture God's glory and your need of Him. I mentioned this uh, last time, a couple episodes ago, about how the Holy Spirit brings obedience to the disobedient. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. The Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. If you know someone in your life who does not obey the gospel, who is out of step with the Holy Spirit of God, and you have a great love for them, you have an evangelistic zeal for them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, pray unto the Holy Spirit that He would bring obedience where there is disobedience. Pray that the Holy Spirit would bring life where there is death. This is what the Holy Spirit can do. Jesus desires our obedience to the faith. Jesus desires our obedience to His commands. And yet only the Holy Spirit can do this. And here's the wonderful gift. You have access to the Holy Spirit, not only for your own life, but asking that God would bless others' lives with this same truth and this same obedience. The Holy Spirit gives formidable, unmistakable life. Look what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 49. God's Word says this, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And he ends the chapter by saying this, Therefore, be steadfast and movable, my beloved brothers, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit within you makes you have a formidable, unmistakable life and life abundant? Charles Spurgeon was asked, how do you do everything that you do? You know, running the college, running the orphanage, preaching, you know, four or five times a week, writing more words than any person in history. How do you do this? Spurgeon would say, well, you have to remember, there are two of us. He was talking about Charles Spurgeon, the man, and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, living within him, the Spirit of Christ living within him. This is a letter from one Christian to another. They write this, I cannot express how I sympathize with you in your time of suffering. I suffer along with you, but still it cheers me to know that God loves you and the very proof that God loves you is that he does not spare you, but lays upon you the cross of Jesus Christ. Whatever spiritual knowledge or feelings you may have, they are all a delusion if they do not lead us to a real and constant practice of dying to self. And it is true that we do not die to self without suffering. The great physician who sees us, uh, who sees in us what we cannot see, knows exactly where to place the knife. He cuts away that which we are most reluctant to give up. So give yourself up to his plans. Why be so concerned about the dried up streams when the rivers of living water are so available? Take up the cross that Christ gives you. It is an honor from God that he gives you a cross to carry. And know that the eventual goal is to take you away from the dried up streams that cannot produce water to the living water of Jesus Christ, the unmistakable, formidable life of the Spirit who lives within you. He gives you the strength and the endurance and the wherewithal of two because it's Jesus and you. It's the Spirit and you. So therefore be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
You are not merely a son of Adam. Adam was a man from the dust, and he was a living being, and from him comes all people through his wife Eve. But you are also a dearly beloved child of God, and you belong to the life-giving second Adam, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. He is not only living, but he's life-giving. You're not just a son of Adam, but you are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So not only do you have natural life, but you have spiritual life. There is two of you. And so go, serve your king with strength, wherewithal, formidable, unmistakable, abundant life because of this Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit gives to each child of God spiritual gifts. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. It's there that we find the teaching of spiritual gifts. The Apostle Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that you, when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Just as there is one body and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. One body, but many members, and each has a variety of gifts, whether faith or mercy, giving, utterance of wisdom and of prophecy of healing, of tongues, all sorts of things. And we find this also talking about the body life of the kingdom of God and the church of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4. God has given to each child spiritual gifts. Learn what your spiritual gifts are. Do it in the context of the body of Christ, the church, with pastors, elders, and deacons, with those around you, with mothers and fathers in the faith, shaping and helping you find what spiritual gift has God given me? For what? For the purpose of the unity of the body. Not for exalting myself or, or putting myself forward, but just as the Spirit puts forward Christ, the same Spirit who gives you a gift is for this purpose, to make much of Jesus Christ. We are one body with one faith, one Lord, one baptism, yet God has given us a distinction of gifts, many gifts, several offices, one Spirit. Find out who you are. Find out what God has given you to do and do it with all your strength. The Holy Spirit makes you a faithful, simple steward of the faith that's been delivered to you. The Holy Spirit will make you a faithful, simple steward of the faith that's been given and delivered to you. I see this in first, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14. There the Word of God says, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And then you can go down to chapter 2 and verse 2, where it says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The Holy Spirit will make you a faithful guard and steward of the faith and the doctrine that's been delivered to you. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. He will guard the deposit that's been entrusted to you, the gospel and the doctrine of Christ. And it's the same Holy Spirit for those that are given the office and the gift of teaching in the church to go on to teach to other faithful men that faith, doctrine, and deposit of truth to others who will be able to teach others also. Uh, we are a community of faith. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and we look forward to see not only what God will do in our day, but in the future. And a huge part of that is taking what has been deposited to us, not the doctrine that we made up, we don't want that, but the doctrine that has been handed to us, delivered to us by those forefathers that have gone before us, and faithfully stewarding it, 
guarding it by the Holy Spirit so that our children and our children's children might know the same God, the same scripture, and the same gospel. And so Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11 says this, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. That's a direct command from Jesus Christ to the church in Philadelphia. He says to them, hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. God has given you the scripture. God has given you the teaching of the church. God has given you the true history of his people throughout so many millennia. God has given us the teachings of what we are to believe, statements of faith, confessions of faith. Know them first, live them second, and pass them on third. Know them, live them, and pass them on. And all of this is by the Holy Spirit who has given you spiritual gifts, who gives you a formidable, unmistakable life, who brings obedience to the disobedient who gives true freedom and sight, who empowers us to pray in the Spirit for all the saints, who leaves no sinner the same, and who has the humble purpose of making much of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Goodbye.